Hello, this is Joe with Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue, and you are listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it, and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh! Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good evening and welcome to the really big Barbecue Central show. This is the show that talks about all things that are important to the world of barbecue and grilling. The show originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame City, Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard on your Tuesday evenings of live fire fun and frivolity show. If you missed the special exclusive announcement show yesterday, if you've always wanted to jump in on a Tuesday, because we are now back live on Tuesday we'll instead of doing it Wednesday the last two weeks, we are back and better than ever. Here's how you follow the show, and here's how you get in touch with the show, should you see fit. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at the bbqcentralshow.com. Follow us on all the social media channels at BBQ Central Show. And be sure to subscribe to the show podcast feed on your favorite podcast platform. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the bbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening in case you get the newsletter coming up in about 12 minutes from now. It's the second Tuesday of a month. And in that first interview segment, of course, we have the creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue grilling website on the face of the earth. Behead will be joining us. Food safety, because last week we had conversations with Sam, the cooking guy, and somehow we fell into some nonsensical talk about what, what is the safer raw food to eat nonsense however i casually threw in meathead's wife mrs meathead and all of a sudden that sparked an idea in my head and i reached out to meathead after the fact and said hey here's some nonsense sam and i were talking about but since your wife is who she was for many many years before she retired recently would she have thoughts on raw food safety and which one is safer than the other, if at all? And some other stuff. Meathead would obviously have thoughts on that as well. I got some other feedback from experts in the industry that I might get to later in the show. So we'll talk about all of that. Plus, we'll get a book update from Meathead. So stay tuned for that coming up next. And then we will move to 35 past the first hour. Also, on the second Tuesday of the month in this segment, the Contributing barbecue editor to Southern Living Magazine and the person that runs his own website, robertfmoss.com. Robert Moss joins us on the show. Now, as I had mentioned previously, there was a big exclusive show yesterday announcing the 10 finalists that are now in contention for the class of the 2023 Barbecue Hall of Fame. We revealed those names along with first-timer to the show from the American Royal Elizabeth Gunter. But Robert Moss sat in to give a little color and background to the names because Elizabeth is new to the whole scene here. So she wasn't going to have that type of experience and breadth of knowledge at this point. But Robert sat in and made sure that all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed as it relates to the information from all the 10 nominees or 10 finalists, I should say. Uh, They are all, I guess, nominees at this point, and uh, they are now sent out. You know what? Forgo all that. We'll recap everything with Robert as we get to his segment here tonight. We'll go over the list. We'll talk about uh, some finer points. And then we also have Brunswick Stew on the docket here this evening as well. So some Hall of Fame uh, finalist names talk in Brunswick Stew. That'll close the first hour. And then we'll move to the second hour. One of the rising stars and smartest men in the live fire industry. 
who has started to recur on this show frequently. The founder of Combustion Inc., Chris Young, will join us. Chris is also producing a fairly prolific YouTube channel. I think it has towards 80,000 subscribers, which is pretty good for being a fairly new channel. And he's done a few videos that I would like to talk to him a little bit more in depth about. One, of course, is the tempering of meat before you cook it. And then following that up is the topic that I thought was dead and gone, but it has been revived once more, kind of. The searing seal in the juices. Are we going to have to look to perhaps redefine that thought or polish it off a little bit and redefine it? Find out at 1014 this evening in the second hour with Chris Young from Combustion Inc. We'll also get an update on business end of his as well over at Combustion. And then closing out the show, making his second of four appearances here on the Barbecue Central show as he is the star of the 2023 Barbecue Central show, Podumentary, as we look at barbecue food trailers, the popularity of people getting into them as businesses, and I will be joined by the owner-operator of Smoke and Joe's Pit Barbecue, Joe Martinez. And we'll talk about day one of open, selling that first pound or first ribs of barbecue and out for those first three months. So the first quarter of his operating season, we will get into. Uh, Joe has been in operation for about seven months. So we're going to take a look back at those first three. And uh, then we will catch up or we'll try and catch up by the end of the year. Maybe that third visit, we'll get to present day. But this is a good background for those of you thinking that the summertime is going to be the portion of the year where you're really going to put the rubber to the road and get into this barbecue trailer business that you've been hearing so much about, especially on this show for the last two years. So the show laying out Meathead Robert Moss, first hour, Chris Young from Combustion Inc., Joe Martinez from Smoke and Joe's Pit Barbecue in the second hour. You can follow me socially, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat at BBQ Central Show, and we say good evening to those of you watching through one of our video streaming platforms, Facebook or Twitch, slash BBQ Central Show. You can, of course, watch on YouTube as well. And guess what? We have a new YouTube poll question of the week. And it goes a little something like this. Have you ever had potted meat on the heels of our conversation with Sam the Cooking Guy and our bit that was devised by Ron Hatt and ChatGPT? The real question tonight is, have you ever had potted meat? And currently, 88% of you are saying no. You've never had it. And 12% of you are saying, indeed, you have had potted meat. So we'll go ahead and ask all our guests here this evening, and we'll keep that running update for you as the show progresses. So let's start here this evening. And it is with great excitement and great pride that I am here to tell you that the new New Barbecue Central Show website is launched live and available across the globe. It was officially launched this past Friday. and We've been making some small tweaks, adjustments. To say that this is an upgrade over the last new website from earlier this year would be the understatement of 2023. And if you don't mind, we can go ahead and take a look at it in case you're just tuning in here watching on video and you haven't seen it. You will notice right off the bat, it is much different, much more attractive. You have the nice logo at the top. You have some very easy navigation here just below the logo. And then you have a nice hero section. So I've put together what I would call a sizzle reel of some guests that I have had here on the show. There's no sound here, but it just gives you the aesthetic that this is indeed a professional show, a production. You can subscribe to the show right here. And all the way through that main page, we have calls to actions, ways to subscribe, all the way down here, the most infamous animation ever to grace, the Barbecue Central Show, Meathead and I talking about how grilled pineapple is the best thing to come off a grill. Just a taste of what you might listen to or find here on the show. And we have a section for the current show sponsors. Those are all linkable to everybody's website. Then you have a quick nav on some of the highlights, either about the show, past episodes. You can also subscribe to the show. And uh, that's how the homepage works. And then if you run all the way back to the top, you have a little bit more information here about the show. Hey, here's a current view of what I'm looking at during the course of the show. And again, you can 
click uh, here and go right to past shows if you want. You can listen there. Uh, that takes you to my media host, Blueberry, a little bit about the show, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm able to go and change the text, change pictures. Uh, again, another subscribe button right here. You can also subscribe right here on the podcast uh, page and use a bunch of these different operations if you would like. So way more user-friendly. And I have to say this. If you are in the market for upgrading or launching a website, I'm here to give my full recommendation and endorsement. You know what? I want a sec. I'm here to give my full recommendation and endorsement uh, to a company called Jotful, J-O-T-T-F-U-L.com. I worked personally with Natalie and Larry. We had an initial call to discuss the concept, and they were able to understand what my current needs were. We worked through some pretty intense technical issues on the podcast side of things to make sure that the feed would work properly, which it does, thank goodness. And they even got the show email address and the show newsletter sign-up form working again. And the email and newsletter form have been down for months, ever since I switched to that first new website earlier in the year. It had stopped working. I didn't even know about it until somebody had emailed me through one of the social media channels and said, hey, are you just not replying back to my emails for some reason? Or do you hate me? And I, where are you sending it? To Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. Oh, well, okay. And that's when I found out that the show email was how many people emails did I miss? Who knows? That encouraged me that we needed to jump ship immediately because I was being held hostage. So here's what you need to know. If you're in the market for a website, you want to put something together, you want to upgrade. These folks are great because they're professionals. It's not a WordPress architecture. This is their own uh, architecture that they have. Uh, they can give you certain access, but they're here to help. You ask them to make changes, they do it. You want them to add a page, they can do it. You want them to subtract a page, they can do it. So if you're not a website genius like me, this is very important. I can make the changes easily that I know I can make, but if I need help on the heavy lifting, they're there. They charge a monthly fee to do that. I just paid for the year in advance and I'm done with it. And it is money well spent instead of being held tight. If you ever run across urban website designers, head for the hills. It's a lie. It's a scam. They'll trap you. And then once they have you in, they'll start asking for more money. You'll feel pressured. Luckily, I didn't. And then you'll be screwed. And you'll wish you would have went with somebody like Jotful. Again, uh, the website Jotful dot com j o t t f u l so uh, natalie and larry thank you so much go to the new website check it out peruse around see if you see any mistakes whatnot and we can certainly clean it up from there but i'm very happy to have a new new that's two new websites here in 2023 and we're not even through the first half yet but we're racing through it i can tell you that very happy with the website very happy all right, Meathead is ready to go. We'll get to him here in just one second. Pits and Spits has some of the best looking, best cooking smokers and grills on the market today. Pits and Spits offers a full family of products, including traditional offset smokers, wood pellet grills, charcoal grills, travel grills, combination pits, fire pits, and much more. Pits and Spits has been one of the only American fabrication shops that's focused on smokers and grills for almost 40 years. Why is that important? because they're able to put an emphasis on quality and design. They can locally source materials with unmatched attention to detail, from the fully welded barrels to the heavy gauge steel. They bring both function and beauty to life. Pits and Spits builds every product with the intention that it's going to get passed down from generation to generation. Doesn't matter if you're a competition cook or if you're just a backyard griller like me, it's gonna take that barbecue and grilling game to the next level. And there is a product for you, check them out. At pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. That's pits and spits, all spelled out. And that's a double T on the pits and the spits. Pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. Use promo code to check out BBQ Central for a free spice pack when you order $500 or more. That's in accessories, or if you buy a cooker, then of course that's going to be way more than $500 if you're buying a cooker. But it's a great cooker. But at checkout, don't forget the free stuff. Promo code BBQ Central, and then get that free spice pack with your order of $500 or more. 
pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. That's pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. We're back with Meathead right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets. For all your pellet-driven cookers, visit CookinPellets.com for more information or to purchase. You can also peruse the website for further items that might lend a little smokiness to whatever it is you're cooking there on your pellet-driven cooker. The good folks over at CookinPellets.com. My first guest tonight has created the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website ever. He's a best-selling author, a barbecue Hall of Famer, and a Barbecue Central Show's guest Hall of Famer racing to the hotline for his second Tuesday of the month regular segment is Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Meathead, we have a YouTube poll question of the week that I need need to ask you about here this evening. Have you ever tried potted meat? No, I've had pot, but not meat. Right. Well, I have to say you are in the a little more than slim majority here. 69% of voters are saying they have never had potted meat. 31% are saying that they have. Uh, it's a little closer than I thought it was going to be, but uh, I myself sit in the no category, and after being trapped on a plane two weeks ago heading back from Texas, with a guy that decided to crack open a can of potted meat only 30 minutes from landing, I said, I don't know if I'll ever be motivated to try potted meat, but that's what the YouTube Wait, uh, is. not spam potted meat? Yeah, well, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff here in the instant chat about is spam potted meat. I think that might be some type I think of so. a, a cousin or a stepsister to potted meat. But yeah, what yeah, I and saw, I've had sardines. What I saw. Was it like anything else? And it had a smell unlike anything else. And it was just a straight up on a what looked like a cat food can. And it said potted meat. Like spam is spam. Uh, the, those Vienna sausages are Vienna sausages. This is yeah. potted meat. And that's how it's tagged. So it would, it, the name alone uh, is sticking with me for life. Uh, burned into my nose and brain. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Meathead, you're back at it, and we love to have you each and every month. And as I had mentioned to you off air, I got into somewhat of a nonsense conversation with Sam the Cooking Guy last week, and we were talking about eating raw beef. We were talking about eating raw chicken. And I said, well, gee, Sam, you know, I don't think Mrs. Meathead would even approve of the conversation that we're having, <laughs> as whimsical as it is. And he said, well, who's Mrs. Meathead? And I said, well, of course, that's the lady that's married to Meathead. And he said, oh, my goodness. And he had no idea what Mrs. Meathead uh, had been up to professionally. So I schooled him, and he became a little bit more interested. So I thought we would talk a little meat safety here this evening. And uh, before we get going, I would like to ask you, how is the book? Because we're taking bets. The embedded correspondents are both betting for and against you on if thing is actually going to happen. But where are we before we talk about food safety? I turned in the manuscript on Monday. Um, I have 90% of the photographs done. Um, the rest of them are due end of this month. Uh, it's running over 600 pages. They want a 400-page book. So my editor and I face a... Uh, a, a battle uh, trying to get it down to 400 pages and uh, it is on schedule to be out in spring 2024. How are you going to decide what gets cut? I would imagine that's like cutting one of your kids out uh, for every yeah. page. So how do you figure what gets edited? Well, I knew I was running long, so I spent a great deal of time the last month cutting. For example, the recipe section had 15 cocktails all made with smoke and fire. And they hit the cutting room floor. All of them. Um, I'm going to have to put them into an ebook or something else. There just wasn't room. 
Um, it, it, it is. It's tough, tough. A lot of stuff in there is very, uh, well, among other things, there's a big section on food safety. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that she won't uh, want to cut it. Uh, we'll, I, I've done this before. Um, any professional writer learns how important an editor is. And I know your next guest, Robert Moss, will say the same thing. Um, editors really are your friend. Amateur writers, and I have had a lot of them work for me, uh, cling to every precious word. Mm. And how dare you change a sentence or modify or cut a paragraph. Or, but um, I've worked for Lou Grant's. Um, you know, I've been a professional writer since I was 20. So uh, 54 years. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the process. We'll wrap it up. It'll be a good book. I'm very proud of it. So let's transition to a little bit of food safety talk since we're worried if that might be cut out of this book coming in 2024. Uh, the first part of the conversation that I had with Sam, we were talking about raw beef and mm -hmm. I had talked about my newfound appreciation for carpaccio that morphed into talking about steak tartare, which then brought up the conversation mm -hmm. of the two. Which one is safer to eat? And I said, to me, it makes sense that the carpaccio might be safer because it's being sliced off of, let's say, a whole muscle where tartare, depending on where you're getting it done, might be ground. Uh, maybe it's meat that's finely diced and, you know, pressed into a mold, whatever. Now you probably have the quail egg on top of that, which adds a whole nother flavor of potential danger to it. But holding that off to the side before we put it on the top to eat it between the two is one safer to eat than the other. Well, I would agree that the whole muscle meat, the sliced meat would be slightly safer. Let me back up for just a little bit because Please. you mentioned my wife. Um, she uh, just retired as the uh, um, chief food technology uh, 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 branch director, uh, the, the division of food processing science and technology at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And she was also editor of Food Microbiology Magazine. And so she probably knows as much about the subject as anybody. And we talk a lot about it. And uh, she has informed me. I am not the expert, uh, but- uh, Maybe we should have her uh, on the I know show. a lot more than most folks. Um, with that said, let's do a little background here. Um, there, there are three serious risks to eating f food, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Um, and uh, bacteria are the greater risk and that we, we, we've we heard of things like listeria and salmonella, um, botulinum, um, and maybe you've heard of vibrio, and of course, E. coli. Um, and they get, they these are bacteria. Viruses are an issue, but they're not as big an issue but they are a problem. They're harder to kill. And parasites are an issue, um, but um, particularly in seafood, um, ringworms, tapeworms, and so on, such as that. But for most everything that we're talking about here in barbecue and world, we're talking about bacteria. Um, my wife and other food scientists have a saying, heat cooking is the kill step. Um, you can kill just about every bacteria in the 160 to 165 range. Um, so anything raw carries a level of risk. And then the question is, what is the level of risk? Can you guess what is the riskiest food in the grocery store? I think I know this from previous conversations. It's sprouts. Say? Sprouts. Yes. Bean sprouts. Yeah, vegetables are particularly dangerous. Lettuce, I mean, I mean, if you think about the food recalls you've heard, a lot of it is lettuce, spinach, um, because we eat them raw. And how do they get contaminated? Well, they're sitting out in the field, exposed to air, which has bacteria and other things in it. There's Tweety Bird flying overhead, Mickey Mouse running around in between the rows, Bambi, Porky Pig, Bugs Bunny, they're all running around out there and they and including the humans that are picking that may have just used the outhouse and not washed properly. 
So anything raw that comes out of the field or that you eat from the grocery store is by nature riskier than something you've cooked. So the question then becomes, what is the risk? You know, I mean, first of all, the greatest risk we all face in this life is when we get into an automobile. Far greater than anything we eat. Far greater than in an airplane, even if they're eating potted meat next to you. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the risk of death from f- bacteria in food is fairly low, but it's there. Um, and when we start now, E. coli, for example, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of E. coli. Your body has got a whole bunch of them in them. Most of them are um, harmless. Some of them, they call them stex, shigatoxin, E. coli's. Um, they're nasty. They can really screw you up. I mean, for life. Um, um, Clostridium botulinum, botulism, it can kill you. The thing is, is there's not a lot of it running around out there. But when you go into the Italian restaurant and they put a bottle of olive oil on the table with garlic in it, the risk goes up because garlic grows underground and botulism loves anaerobic or where there's no air. And there's that little garlic that may have botulism spores on it in a bottle of oil where there's no air. So there are things that we need to know about and be careful about. And among other things, when we're handling food, um, you know, uh, the, the other thing that is really good to know when you're handling food is chlorine. Chlorine is your friend. You, we should define, I'm sorry, I'm rambling away from your topic of the two different kinds of meats, but this background information I think is helpful. Yes. We should talk about the differenti- differentiation between pasteurization and sterilization. Sterilization is a process by which everything is killed and it's really hard to do and it's really expensive. Pasteurization is where almost everything is killed. There's a tolerance or an allowable tiny, tiny bit that is not likely to cause harm. And that food scientists talk about the load. That is how many bad guys are on the food. Um, and th- that that really can depend on how it's been handled and so on. So pasteurization is what we do when we cook. Um, we're not sterilizing, we're pasteurizing. And you got to know out there, there's common misinformation that vinegar, alcohol, salt, lemon juice, freezing will pasteurize or make your food safe. None of those can kill enough bacteria to make food safe. They can hamper growth. Salt will hamper growth. It will kill some. But chlorine and heat are your friends. Chlorine and heat are the way to make food safe. Now, you don't want to take a steak and dunk it in chlorine, obviously. (laughs) But you want to use it to clean your cutting boards and your work surfaces and things you're working on. All right, so getting back to who's right and who's wrong, I say carpaccio is safer yes. to eat than steak tartare. You would agree with that? I would say that the rather than safer, the risk. I would say the risk is lower. And the reason for that is you probably know this. Your listeners probably know it, but let me just give you the quick, the quick thumbnail on this one too. Cattle have fixed hides, and they're usually brought to these um, big concentrated feeding areas where they wander around, they eat food. There's a lot of dust in the air, a lot of poop on the ground, and E. coli gets on their hide. When they're slaughtered, they're brought into the slaughterhouse and a knife goes down their um, belly and the hide is taken off and that knife can get contaminated from the uh, hide and it could cut into the meat. Also, if they accidentally cut open the intestines, um, the, what's in the intestines can contaminate. It can get on the floor and get on the work surfaces. If it gets on the meat, it's not a good thing. But if it gets on the meat, it's usually on the surface. These guys, the bacteria, they're too large. Just like garlic is too large. Just like sugar is too large to get into the meat. Salt can get in because it's really tiny. But bacteria just generally cannot get beyond the little tiny cracks and crevices on the surface. So 
the minute you throw a steak on a hot grill, boom, 160, 165 degrees, they're gone. Mm. But when you take that steak, if it has been contaminated, and there's a good chance it has, and grind it up, now whatever was on the surface is on the inside. And so you have to cook it to 160 to 165 to kill it pure. Now, USDA says 155 for ground meat, so 155. Now, the other thing is, and we don't have time to get into this, is that it's not just temperature, but it's time and temperature. Because you can kill almost everybody at 131, not 160 to 165, but it takes hours. Yeah. It takes hours to kill them at 131. So it's, it's all very, very complicated. But the, be, the, 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 the best guide that my wife and food scientists and I can share is cook it. Cook it, and you got nothing to worry about. Um, I don't know, frankly, what the fascination is with raw beef. It just doesn't taste all that great to me. I mean, give me a steak, and let me salt and pepper it or put my meatheads rub on it and throw it on a hot grill and get the Maillard reaction on the surface. And when you cook something, you break down the, the cell walls, the, uh, the fibers, and the juices flow and the flavors are there. Raw meat doesn't have that much going for it in my world. The other argument that we had or a talk that we were having, Sam was on a recent trip to South Korea. He was dining with some top men and women in the industry, whatever that means. And he was given uh, something to eat. It looked like a rose petal a design, if you will. And there's not a lot of English being bantered around. He had asked a couple of folks who it was. But in order to not offend anybody, he just ate it. He said it tasted good, um, a little, uh, not weird, but uh, something that was a little uh, eye-catching as far as texture was concerned, but said the taste was good, ate it. And then finally it worked back around that it was raw chicken. And I said, oh, geez, I would have loved to know that in advance. I would do that. And Sam had said, well, this is the, the question I'm getting to. Is there any truth that if the chick or the meat is held of a certain standard, even in its raw state, it's safer to eat than if it's commodities brand beef or chicken? Or less way- risky, if we should say it that way? Yeah, thank you. The the way animals are raised, the way they're slaughtered, the way they're processed can lower the risk. Mm. Um, So I suppose it's conceivable to raise chickens under pristine anaerobic, not anaerobic, antiseptic conditions and get safer chicken meat. Among all of our meats out there in this country, chicken is among the most dangerous, mm. and it has to do the way with the way it's processed, um, and it, it, the way is it's exposed, it's dunked in water and hot water to remove the feathers and such, and that hot wa- water is easily contaminated by w- what's in their guts because they haven't been eviscerated yet when they're dunked in the hot water. Um, and that can get on the bird. So it is, th- th- which is why USDA says you cook chicken to 165. Uh, th- without going into detail, I think 160 is okay. Um, and there's a big difference in flavor between 160 and 165. Um, and USDA, I think, says 145 for beef. Well, I mean, if a steakhouse cooked all its meat to 145, they go out of business in a week because that's beyond medium. I mean, it's almost not even pink anymore. Um, 130 to 135 is what everybody likes best. But because it's solid muscle meat, it's fairly safe. Um, I've heard of raw chicken being served in Asia. Um, I wouldn't eat it personally. Um, But, um, you know, uh, I suppose it's possible to be made safe. If you have any other questions about food safety or food recipes or you want to get a great book for Memorial Day or Mother's Day, of course, that's coming up here in less than a week, you go to AmazingRibs.com. You can also join the Pitmasters Club. And, Meathead, I don't want to not say anything 
as it's been scrolling across the screen over the last 18 minutes. But certainly, <laughs> I appreciate what you're doing there. It uh, means a lot to me, and uh, that's more than any Barbecue Hall of Fame uh, finalist list nomination would be or getting in is just knowing that folks think that. So uh, well, I appreciate our should, French. We tell the folks who, who aren't watching but listening that uh, I have a Chiron or a scroll across the bottom of my screen right now that says that Greg Rempe belongs in the Hall of Fame, and he uh, and it's just shocking that he wasn't even nominated <laughs> this year. The process has some weaknesses, um, and, uh, you know, i really love to stay on and join Moss on that conversation. But the biggest weakness in my world, in my book, is the nomination process. You can't just nominate Greg Rempe and say he's great. You got to basically know his biography and his resume on that form. They ask you all kinds of stuff. And Greg, when we were, I, we've talked personally offline before, you've got a much richer resume than I knew about, and I've known you for years. Um, their job should be to gather the information on you, not me to put that in there. Um, that I should just be able to put Greg Rempe, and if they get enough nominations, then they have to contact you mm. for your curriculum vitae, your resume, your information, and then that has to be brought to the committee for discussion. Um, and I think that's the biggest weakness in the in the system now. I don't know how I got through. <laughs> Who cares? You're through. Hall of Fame. And more importantly than that, Barbecue Central Show's guest Hall of Famer, and that's why you see him here the second Tuesday of every month as we open the interview segments. Meathead, always appreciate it. Have a great Memorial Day, and we'll see you in June. You too, buddy. There he is. Meathead right there. Amazingribs.com. And uh, by the way, Robert Moss is ready to rock and roll, so I'm sure he will have some feedback off of what Meathead just said. Amazingribs.com. If you care to visit, I'm sure everybody's already visited. But if your mom is somebody who's a live fire appreciator of any form or fashion, and you want to give her a little bit more inside scoop aside from the book, maybe consider getting her a year-long membership to the Pitmasters Club. Why not? Amazingribs.com. Sign up for the Pitmasters Club. It's less than 25 bucks for the year. Let her get in touch with all the great backyard barbecue grilling men and women out there across the globe get inspiration that's the place to go amazingribs.com and the pitmasters club for a mother's day gift who thought about that me meathead will take 50 percent of all revenues derived from the shotgun uh mother's day marketing campaign that i just launched on your behalf that you didn't ask me to do all right uh, we'll be back with robert moss contributing barbecue editor to Southern Living Magazine right after this. Stick around. Be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. And we welcome you back. We thank Meathead for joining us last segment. Amazingribs.com is his website. So check that out. And he did say, by the way, if you're keeping track on books, that the manuscript is in. So folks that were betting against Meathead, I think you've got some paying up to do. But we'll certainly keep track of that as well. My next guest, the contributing barbecue editor to Southern League Magazine, as I had just said, coming out of the break. An accomplished author, also a restaurant critic, and a regular guest here on the second Tuesday of every month. We welcome back. Robert Moss to the show, and not only welcome him back to this show, but turning in about 24 hours' time as he sat in for the uh, 10 finalist Barbecue Hall of Fame name nominations. That sounded really bad as it was coming out of my mouth, but you know what we're talking about here. <laughs> uh, before we get to any rebuttal that you might have to Meathead's on the way out spiel, 
we have to hit the YouTube poll question of the week. Oh, yeah. Which is, have you ever had potted meat? Yes, I have. Yes, all right. As it's delineated, potted meat on the can? Yeah, literally a can yeah. with, I don't know if it was Hormel or Armor, but it was probably 69 cents from a gas station. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's and about I, right. The obvious question would be, if you've not, have you ever been fishing? Because the only time I've ever had potted meat was uh, in a boat uh, on a lake somewhere. Were you using it as bait? No, no. It's a, you get up in the morning, you know, you head out you know, about dawn, you start drinking PBR about 7 in the morning, about 10 o'clock. Pot of meat sounds pretty darn good. So, uh, And you don't need a refrigerator or anything for it. So that's 67% a of the voting public of YouTube are also saying, that no, they have not had uh, potted meat yet. So you are currently sitting in the firm minority of 33% saying that they have had potted meat. So all right, you, you were listening to Meathead go uh, off a little bit on what he feels are the shortcomings of the names committee as it relates to the Barbecue Hall of Fame. So if you have any type of rebuttal to that, I'll give you stage to offer it up. Yeah, well, somehow he made it through the this 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 process. So, um, you know, something, something seems to be working. Um, the, the one rebuttal I would have is to say, um, you know, yes, we do have a form. We ask people to fill out and put information in, but it's not like that we have a committee that just reads the responses and, and is doing an essay contest. Um, you know, those are inputs. Everyone on the committee, if, if you're, if you're getting through to the, to the top 10 list, people already know who those, those people, those, those people are. The, uh, the nomination form, we actually slimmed it down uh, this year. It, it, fewer questions because we felt like we don't need to make people write essays. We're just trying to get some input from the from the nominees. That's the input to the process. So it's not like, um, uh, yeah, I, I suppose you could give us a whole long list of names when we go do research. But the, the fact of the matter is most people on the committee already know who, are, who these folks are. The uh, information on the form is, is a chance to add some extra information, maybe think about things we didn't know you know, make that job a little easier. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know how to, to make that process work, uh, work, work any better than it does. I feel like that the challenge is there's just too darn many people who are worthy and it's very, very hard to, to, to slim that list down to, to 10 people. I certainly don't want to speak for Meathead or put words in his mouth, but I think maybe where he was going as I simplify this is that folks would go in and vote for a name or a few names. And once the names hit whatever agreed upon benchmark uh, the names committee was so let's say it's a 70 nominations uh, once that name hits 70 then it's put into a list where then the names committee would go through and start doing this research project that meathead was talking about so that would slim out a bunch you'd have to get to so many before those names crossed over and then you would have a pool of names where you would argue for nine or, or ten to make up that list well, I guess the question is what what's what's the what's the problem you're trying to solve? Is the problem that uh, there aren't there are people who we just don't know about who aren't getting considered, or is it going into the discussion? It's hard discussion. We we weigh a bunch of factors and have to make the call. So I I think the process as it is 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 pretty good. I can't think of a way to improve it. We're always interested in, in input, but um, it, the the flip side is if you start doing things like tallying how many votes people get. Now you just get a you know, a campaign to get out the vote and and to use social media and everything else to get a bunch of of uh, input flooding in. It, it's it's I think it's it's a a more deliberative process which I like and being a part of the discussions. We we have a lot of discussions weighing the pros and not the pros and cons, but weighing like the accomplishments, where people are in their career, is it you know, who you get should get in before. So I, I don't think any of those tweaks would. Uh, in any way make those change those decisions or make those decisions easier i think this is a matter there's so many good people and only only so many we can get in each year robert moss joining us here on the show robert f moss.com is his website you can also follow him over on twitter and other social media handles so let's go ahead and recap the list of names and give any thoughts that you or i might have you know i didn't realize that there were i thought there were like two uh second time around folks that are on this list but there actually ends up being i believe four that are at least two-time uh, nominees uh, and, and maybe uh, more actually five uh i went back oh. if you look uh steve okay. grady who made it uh was uh is the fifth so byron chisholm flora Payne, donnie teal darren worth and steve grady were all on the list last year so uh five of them were on the list and then we have uh the the, the five new folks 
um, which is David Close, uh, Fast Eddie Morin, Roger Mooking, Malcolm Reed, and Dave Raymond, aka Sweet Baby Dave. Oh, when sorry, you look, Sweet Baby, Sweet Baby Ray. Sweet Baby Ray, of course. Uh, when you look at the list, are there any names that are jumping out at you? Uh, maybe because they're at least two times on the list. If you start to look back over how the classes have gone here over the last couple of years, it seems the folks with the best odds have also seen this list uh, second time around or third time around, and then they end up crossing over becoming a, an active member for that year's induction. Is that something that you see following suit here because we have now five, at least two time nominees? Well, I think if you've made it, uh, you know, through the, the under the list twice, but didn't you didn't get picked the previous time? You're probably pretty close. We moved. Uh, actually, it used to be three people would, would get inducted. Now, now four people got inducted last year, so there's there's more slots. So I think it is probably telling that you know we we had uh, you know that the, we we had nine last year inducted four that leaves five. All five of them I think are back again this year because they were worthy of nomination. And you know we we are we, we argued about folks and we, we you know we went up and down, but ultimately those five stayed on there. So I think that that is sort of that's what I, I think you see it on the baseball hall of fame as well and other things like that is people tend to get on the ballot and they have to go through a couple of years, but they they finally get their their due once they're on there long enough. For the folks that didn't tune in yesterday or they're just new listeners kind of learning about the Hall of Fame. There's an open period where you nominate whoever you want. Um, those names are collected, uh, and then they're argued over, or um, yeah, let's just say argued over uh, by the names committee. And then of those big pool of names, you are arriving at this pool of ten, or the ten finalists of which now the top four vote getters off of this list. And the people voting are the current living members of the Barbecue Hall of Fame. So Meathead is going to be voting on this list along with all the other living members of the Barbecue Hall of Fame. And those top four names off of this 10 that get the most votes are going to be the ones that make up the 2023 Barbecue Hall of Fame class, correct? That's correct. Now, for the six that don't make it, they get thrown all the way back into the main hopper and they have to rise back up again to be requalified for the list, correct? Or do they stay on the uh, the 10 nomin or the finalist nomination? No, they, they, there's no, it's not like you stay on the 10. Uh, in, in practicality, if you made it this year to the 10, you take four away, it's probably unlikely you're going to fall off unless are there a whole bunch of new people going to get swept in that, you know, have never been nominated before that might, might knock you off. It happens every now and again. But I, I think the idea is that, you know, you sort of have, the large pool of everybody getting nominated, uh, a number of those bubble to the top as being the ones who are very worthy of consideration. We go through the hard work of slimming that down to 10. And I think, you know, unless um, something changes dramatically, I think it will be the, you know, once you're on that list, you're probably going to be on it the next year unless you know, like say something unexpected happens. But we do get new people coming in each year, uh, but, you know, to, to backfill the, 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 the folks who were inducted. So there's there's lots of room for next year. And you basically have five years if if somebody nominates you and then you don't get nominated it's again. It's actually three years. Three yeah. years, right. but um, to three years. Yeah, you know, if if someone doesn't nominate, you know, somebody next year, we we carry the three years worth. So you you could be up for consideration for three years. If no one is no re renominates, then then you're sort of out of the pool, and that's out of that out of the big pool. But if somebody renominates you on year three, you're back in for another three years. So it's just a way to you know you know, slim down the pool. So we aren't considering the, you know, dozens and dozens of people who, you know, who haven't been re-nominated re for a while. When you look at the new nominees this year, Dave Close, Fast Eddie, Roger Mooking, Malcolm Reed, Dave Raymond, uh, this is just us gals talking. Is there anybody that sticks out to you as a favorite of potentially going in? No, it, it, it really is hard for me to predict. Um, who who the because this is going to be voted on by all the uh, the past inductees. We have some new members who are inducted. Um, some people may not vote this year, so it's hard hard for me to know who will resonate best with that larger pool uh, out there. So I think pretty much the odds are are good for almost almost everyone. And I think it just you know it, it's hard to read the tea leaves. We certainly had a hard time you know just getting down to these ten. So hmm. so I think they're all very worthy. So I'll be curious to see how the uh, 
uh, the larger panel uh, ends up on the on the top four. Well, I'm not going to give you my voting credentials because it would blow up my fourth Tuesday of the month embedded correspondence segment this time of the year when we all take this list and then decide who we would be putting in and see how right we are because one day later uh, we'll actually do the Hall of Fame class announcements anyway. That'll be done exclusively here on the show on the 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So. That's uh, tying up the Hall of Fame stuff from yesterday and uh, talking about the process, all that stuff. Uh, with the remaining time, uh, and you tell me if we don't have enough, I was going to broach the subject of Brunswick stew. Um, is it worth getting into for five or six minutes, or do we need more time? Uh, well, we, I could talk for hours, but I think we could <laughs> we could hit some of the high points of Brunswick stew, particularly Brunswick stew, Low Country Boil, Georgia, Virginia. Maybe we can we can sort of separate those out. So I'm not sure where you want to start with Brunswick stew, but we can take a couple minutes. And So I said Brunswick stew when you were on last time. And then within the instant yeah. chat, somebody said Brunswick stew. I think that's also known as low country boil. So as somebody who yeah. is in the low country, is are these synonymous terms or are they completely different? C completely different. The only thing they have in common is that they are both uh, sort of single pot dishes, depending on how you cook them. A Brunswick stew is a is is one of the various classic barbecue stews, along with uh, hash and rice here in South Carolina, burgoo in Kentucky. It's a long, slow simmered stew with meats and and vegetables simmered over a fire originally for hours and hours on end until it just sort of breaks down. Uh, a low country boil, also known as Frogmore stew, uh, also sometimes called uh, Beaufort stew is a low country South Carolina creation, uh, not that old. It goes back to, as far as I can tell to about the 1960s, whereas Brunswick stew goes back until the early 19th century. Uh, a low country boil is a one pot dish, but that's about all the only similarity has to Brunswick stew and they both have corn in them. Uh, it's a seafood dish. It's actually really easy. If you, if you are making it, we do all the time here. You put a big pot of water on the boil. It takes about 20 minutes. You start at 20 minutes, you throw uh, potatoes in the, in the pot. You go a little while longer, about 10 minutes uh, in or 10 minutes left on your countdown, you throw in uh, some sausage, usually smoked beef sausage and maybe some onions. About eight minutes in, you throw in some corn. In the last five or so minutes, maybe three, you throw in a bunch of, of shrimp in the shell. And you just boil them. And, and then when the timer's up, you dump them all out, strain them. Uh, if you're doing it outdoors, they'll spread a big table with newspaper and just dump all the shrimp and the corn and everything. You just go to town, uh, ducking, uh, you know, peeling the shrimp, dunking it in cocktail sauce and eating it. So it's a, a quick cook stew. It's only you know, 20 minutes tops. Uh, you can do it in a steamer basket. A lot of place, a lot of folks in the low country will also throw blue crab in there around minute 10 and steam the blue crab. And so you're breaking up, up crabs. So it's pretty much a seafood stew, quick stew dating to the sixties, whereas uh, Brunswick stew goes, well back into the 19th century and has long been associated with uh, with barbecue. Now, when I'm looking at a little bit of history of Brunswick stew, quickly I realize that there are two states specifically that are laying claim to Brunswick stew, Georgia and Virginia. Do you have a reference on who should be laying proper claim? Yeah, it's uh, absolutely undisputed um, that Virginia is the origin uh, state of Brunswick stew. Um, there is a Brunswick County, Virginia, uh, south side of Virginia, down below Richmond. And then there's a, a city called Brunswick in Georgia. And because, uh, the Brunswick Sioux has been around since the 1820s, at least, uh, it first started popping up in Georgia. Um, it gets a little complicated, but really not until the 20th century. And people just sort of stuck the label on it. Um, it a much longer story than that. Uh, I actually read a very in-depth piece on the complicated history of Brunswick stew for Southern living, if you want to get into the, the details of it. But no, uh, Brunswick stew is originated in Virginia as a uh, hunting stew, originally made with squirrel, uh, and along with corn, tomatoes, and various things over time, slow simmered. Brunswick stew in Georgia really wasn't called that until the, the, the 20th century. I have a theory that, um, that Georgia's Brunswick stew actually evolved out of South Carolina's house, uh, hash and rice, which is a hog killing stew, totally different than a, a hunting stew. And over time, add some ingredients, added in and picked up the Brunswick name. Uh, if you want to get to the, the full details of that, we can either talk about it next time or folks can go, uh, I would just go Google complicated history of Brunswick stew, you'll find my Southern Living article. This sort of goes into 
great detail on that. Why do you see Brunswick stew associated with a lot of pretty big name barbecue restaurants? Like when I look at it, I'm I think if there's a Brunswick stew on a barbecue restaurant's menu, they're not selling a lot. They're not selling out of their barbecue meat and they need a way to repurpose what's left over. It's not going to be that good in its regular form the next day. So they put it in a Brunswick stew. If you are in North Carolina, Virginia, maybe Tennessee, that that's a good bet. Uh, it is a way and, and, and increasing other, other places, but uh, increasingly there, yeah, that is a way to use up leftover barbecue. Uh, Georgia Brunswick stew, uh, most of the sort of classic restaurants that cook it, they're not reusing. They're starting with fresh meat. In fact, a lot of places in Georgia will start with beef, like a like a, a beef round roast or something like that. Um, you know, but it's always fresh meat, pork shoulder that's then cooked long, low and slow in a pot and simmered down. So there's a big difference between taking fresh meat, cooking it long, low and slow until it sort of breaks down with a bunch of spices versus taking and dicing up cooked meat and sort of throwing it in. And you'll see that in the texture, the texture of a Georgia Brunswick stew is very thick. It's almost like a gravy. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you go up to North Carolina, it's almost like a, you know, a, a stew with pork and, and vegetables or a soup, I should say, with, with pork and vegetables in it. Very, very thick. This is probably or a very loaded, thick pieces of meat. This is probably a loaded question as we end the segment here, but is Virginia perhaps the most undervalued or underrated or underappreciated state as it relates to to barbecue history? I would say Virginia with Georgia as a close second. Um, and it's sort of a chron chronological thing. I, there's a chapter or a section in my uh, barbecue history called Whatever Happened to Virginia Barbecue? Uh, and if you read the, the uh, Barbecue, the History of American Institution, I go into great detail about Virginia as the birthplace of barbecue. Um, it was it had a very strong barbecue tradition you read about down in Texas in the 1850s and 1860s, uh, people cooking an old Virginia style barbecue. It was the birthplace of barbecue, really faded out in the 20th century. Um, fast forwarded toward the, around the turn of the 20th century, 1890s, Georgia was uh, the the hotbed of barbecue. All you know, everyone talked about old old timey Georgia style barbecue, et cetera. Now, you, uh, 100 years later, you have people writing articles. You know, is, this, is there such a thing as Georgia barbecue or is there such a thing as Virginia style barbecue? And maybe there isn't exactly any more. I, I, I think there is much more on the Georgia front. But yeah, Virginia uh, used to have a very unique barbecue style. It has a long tradition. It's largely been forgotten, though it's still out there if you know where to look. And uh, I think Georgia's sort of on the same way as a lot of these old places like Fresh Air Barbecue and, and others are still lingering around, but a lot of, a lot of places are are disappearing that used to cook the old Georgia style. And in Georgia, at least Brunswick stew is a classic part of the Georgia style of barbecue and has been for, for, a, a, you know, over a century now. Robert Moss, the contributing barbecue editor to Southern living magazine and monthly guest right here on this show. Robert, always appreciate the great information and we'll see you in June. Yeah, thanks Greg. All right. If you didn't know about Brunswick stew, now you know about Brunswick stew and did he say Frogmore stew? Yeah, Frogmore stew. Hash and rice, which was a hog-killing dish. Hog-killing. Uh -oh. Watch out, hog. All right, let's get ready to wrap the first hour. We'll be back right after this. Stick around. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. And we thank Robert Moss for joining us last segment. RobertFMoss.com is his website. And if you missed it, you will get the podcast early in the morning tomorrow. We'll talk about all of that here in the second hour. Interesting to hear about how Virginia is an overlooked state, the birthplace of barbecue, and Texas is flipping their lid. We're the ones that came up with all this barbecue. Texas. But no, the history books would say otherwise. In fact, there was a guy who was a, he was a large fan of this show. Maybe he still is. Joe Haynes out of Virginia who single-handedly tried to repurpose the spotlight back on Virginia as being the birthplace 
of barbecue here in this country. I think he wrote a book on it. Really big book. Might have won some awards. OC Barbecue, Obsessive Compulsive Barbecue was his website or blog, what he was running. Anyway, uh, we thank Meathead. We thank Robert Moss. We're pointing to the second hour, so refresh your libations. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. Be right back. This is Doug Scheiding of Rogue Cookers, Texas Embedded Correspondent. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How's it going? You have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what, what, what seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the, in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? We ate two feet before we nursed. Delicious, Laverne. Shit, face. I'm shaking like a dog. Shit, peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. <laughs> top men. And just like that, we are into the second hour of the Barbecue Central Show where we talk about all things that are important in the world of barbecue and grilling. It's a two-hour live show happening each and every Tuesday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We'll do it live. We are also recording audibly for podcasts. So if you missed the first hour or you missed the second hour, you will get that first hour number one tomorrow at some point early in the morning, Wednesdays. And the second hour will be here on Thursday, and I'll tell you about Friday here in just one second. Chris Young from Combustion Inc. is still to come on the show tonight, and also Joe Martinez from Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue, the 2023 Podgimentary Spotlight has been shined on him, and we'll talk about the first three months of his operation at Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue, the barbecue food trailer. This show originating from... Palm City, USA, Cleveland. And we say good evening to those of you watching the show tonight through one of the video streaming platforms, Facebook or Twitch slash BBQ Central Show. By the way, Twitch is twitch.tv, not .com. But either or slash BBQ Central Show. You can also watch the show on YouTube slash RD Rempe. And an update on the YouTube poll question of the week. I asked you... Have you ever had potted meat? 70, I'm 70, 59% of you are saying no. It's gotten a lot closer than I thought it was. We're nearly 50, 50, 41% of you are saying you have 59% of you are saying you have not had potted meat. And we will keep the tally going here through the course of the evening. One guest, Robert Moss has had potted meat. And one guest, Meathead, has not had potted meat. So a 50-50 split down the guests here this evening. We'll ask Chris Young and Joe Martinez here as the second hour unfolds. Coming up on the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less this coming Friday, episode 281, taking you back to May 17th of 2011. So 12 years ago, you'll be hearing... From him, live in two weeks' time, but this Friday, the show features barbecue legend, barbecue Hall of Famer, a Barbecue Central Show's guest Hall of Famer, a cookbook author, a TV personality, a five-time overall world grand champion at Memphis in May, Chris Lilly of Big Bob Gibson's. Now in 2011, as you will hear in the show, Big Bob's notched its then third overall title at Memphis in May. They have since won two additional overall world titles in that time, which has them in a deadlock with another Memphis in May legend, Byron Mixon. By the way, here's an update. A Barbecue Central Show exclusive news update. Greg Rampey reporting from the breaking news desk here in Cleveland, Ohio, Bomb City, USA, the city that breaks the smoke live fire breaking news across the the nation, nay, the globe, I have confirmed with the man himself, as Malcolm Reed had mentioned, he thought that Myron Mixon was not going to be at Memphis in May this year because there was a booking confusion with 
Mal, uh, with uh, Myron having booked a class at his house the same weekend as Memphis in May. And I said, well, certainly that can't be the case. Well, I reached out to Myron. I said, I've heard through a few sources that you're not going to Memphis in May. Is that true? And he said, that is 100% true. I'm not going. He books so far in advance for these cooking classes at his house that whenever he got to May a year ago, he didn't put that weekend together with Memphis in May, and he booked a class. So to his credit, as I told him in the text message, was, geez, I don't know what like the last time you missed the Memphis in May was, maybe when you were eight. But this has to be bittersweet. A, from the outsider looking in, very commendable that you would put together a class on Memphis in May's weekend not know about it originally, but I'm sure you had to find out about it weeks ago, months ago, and not say, hey, everybody, we're going to have to move this back. This is kind of a big weekend for me. This is the weekend for me. I'm also in a dead heat lock with Big Bob Gibson's. They're going to go, so we want to make sure we have a shot at breaking this tie and having us come out on the winning end of it. So we're going to have to move the class, but no. He has the class. He's going to do the class. And he said that next year he will absolutely do a better job of planning logistically as it relates to Memphis and May and his classes. But he's already booking January 2024 classes here as we sit in the beginnings of May 2023. So know this, Myron Mixon's classes are very popular and they book very far out in advance. So if you want to get into one, it's probably not happening this year unless somebody backs out and you're able to grab a seat. So... If you want a book, do it now, and it's going to be next year already. It's like getting a truck from Peterbilt or any heavy-duty manufacturer. You're on the waiting list, pal. It's not just something that's going to be happening in the next few weeks. So that has been confirmed. Myron Mixon missing Memphis in May this year because he has a scheduling conflict, uh, con- conflict, or as we say in America, conflict, because he has a cooking class at his house that weekend. Nevertheless, This week's Best Moments show, you will hear from the other side of that deadlock, Chris Lilly. So about a week away, we can change away from the 2023 Memphis in May contest. It'll be nice to hear what Chris and the team went through 12 years ago. And then we'll see what happens here as the 2023 version of Memphis in May takes place. And we'll get a recap on that from Chris himself here in a couple weeks. Don't forget, if you want to hear a guest or segment again on the show that might be lost in the archives, email John, J-O-N, at thebbqcentralshow.com and let them know what you would like to hear. I can say because my email was jacked for the last month or so, there's a really good chance that if you reached out to him through the at thebbqcentralshow.com email, he didn't get those until starting Saturday when I started getting mine again. So if you've put something in, you haven't heard back from him, resubmit just so we both know that he has it and then he can get to work on the show that you would like to hear. Uh, Email reaction from the show last week. Gerald in Texas is writing in. Greg, I didn't see that blindside coming that you delivered to Sam last week regarding the Traeger griddle cooker. Don't you think that was a bit Bush League of you to do? I'm not the host or guest, but I certainly would have taken you to task if I were Sam. Piece of advice going forward. Tread a little more lightly with some of your more notable guests. Love the show. Regards, Gerald. Gerald, thank you for writing it. And after further consideration, Gerald, I would just like to say this. Fuck you. You are 100% right, Gerald. You are not the host. Andrew, you are not the the host. host. And you are not the guest. Andrew, you are not the the guest. So what you have done is you have earned the right to sit back and listen and be entertained with the show. Not Andrew, you are not the host. You have not earned the right to talk about this. Just listen to the show. And if you ever write in again, Gerald, I'm going to ban you from the show. 
and the internet. I can do that. I can ban you from the internet. I've done it before. I'll do it again. You're a punk. You're a dog. <laughs> but you are a punk. And if you ever write in on the show giving me advice on how to handle my guests and how I should tread lightly or not tread lightly, I will ban you from the show, number one. And number two, I will ban you from the internet, period. And that is on Periot. Bruce in Mississippi writing in, Greg, longtime fan and podcast listener, last week's show got me to think, what would the chances be of having both Malcolm and Sam on together to do a segment or two? I think it would be a great combination of information and entertainment. Just something that struck me while I was mowing the lawn late Sunday evening. Love the show. Regards, Bruce. Bruce, thank you for writing it. Now that is something that could actually happen. Maybe we could call it the Barbecue Central Show's Power Hour or something more dopey that sounds more live fire esque I don't know. But Bruce, I don't think I've ever thought of that as something that might actually happen. That could actually happen. I'll get to work on that. Let me see what I can come up with. So we have a dichotomy here, right? We have a good emailer, Bruce in Mississippi, and then we have a punk. Don't be a punk. By the way, the email address works. Greg at the BBQ Central Show dot com. And Gerald, if you're listening to the show, don't email me anymore because I also have you blocked and spammed. You can't get in. Next step, banning you from the internet. Don't make me do that. Banning you from the show, banning you from the internet. All right, Chris Young will be showing up here momentarily before he comes in. I'll ask you this question. Have you tried potted meat? Yes or no? How about this? What do we love about ceramic cookers? We love that they're fuel efficient. We love that they can achieve low and slow temperatures for traditional barbecue meats. Also, because they can get rip-roaring hot for the high-temperature grilling of steaks and other thin cuts. But what's missing in the everyday ceramic cooker lineup? The real ability to do true two-zone cooking. Two-zone cooking is very important to both professional and backyard cooks alike. It's the best way to manage a fire and cook with confidence. However, getting a two-zone fire and a round ceramic cooker is not very realistic. Why? Because it's round. And a Primo grill and the game-changing oval design. This shape gives you the ability to execute that two-zone setup that you desire. It also gives you the other ceramic grill benefits as well. When you break it down, there's more than 60 different ways. Six zero. 60 different ways to cook on that Primo cooker, so you're only limited by your culinary imagination. Plus, they have all the accessories that you could want, like the Primo grill rotisserie, the Primo grill pizza accessory, the half pan, the full pan, the drip pan, the rib rack. They've made modifications to the lift hinge. They have the top and bottom air dampers. What more do you want? There's more coming, I can tell you that. Only sold through dealers, so find one near you, primogrill.com. That's primogrill.com. And here's the bottom line. Best ceramics in the biz, pet net technology, true two-zone cooking capabilities, and multiple sizes of ovals. So go to the dealer near you, see all the sizes of ovals, and then pick the one that works best for you. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram, too, while you're at it. That's primogrill.com. And we're back with Chris Young right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. This portion of the show being brought to you by Pit Barrel Cooker, the most unbelievable outdoor cooking device on the planet, currently available in three sizes with a host of accessories. Doesn't matter if you're just a beginner or a professional, it's a cooker you want to add to that arsenal. Visit pitbarrelcooker.com and tell them the Barbecue Central Show sent you. My first guest tonight is the founder of the Predictive Thermometer System and company called Combustion Inc. And aside from his disrupting of the wireless thermometer industry, he's also turning out some seriously great content on his YouTube channel. 
which can be found at Chris Young Cooks, which currently has about 72,000 subscribers. So if you aren't subscribed yet, head on over and sub up so you don't miss anything coming down the pike that's new. Tonight we're talking about a myth that many of us thought was dead and gone, but perhaps we're going to exhume this body in order to take another look at it, and we'll also talk about his recent work with some of the best smart ovens on the market to see which one might reign supreme. We're, of course, welcoming back our pal Chris Young to the show. Chris, before we get into temping steaks or tempering yep. steaks and searing, sealing in the juices and smart ovens, we have a new YouTube poll question of the week. So I have to ask, Chris, I'm asking the centralites and the general public tonight, have you ever had potted meat? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. The odds and the percentages coming back on this poll are changing at breakneck speed. Uh, One segment ago, it was 69% having never eaten potted meat. But with your answer. Yeah, go I lived in I lived in cooked in England, so potted meat was uh, a popular menu item at, at uh, a lot of pubs. Well, Sam the cooking guy said something specifically about the Brits doing potted meat. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, uh, well, I'm not going out on a limb saying, hey, I've never been to England. I've never been anywhere. But number two, I think whatever you're knowing as potted meat and what I'm asking people is, the potted meat I'm talking about is found at Walmart. Looks like it's in a cat food can, and it says the words potted meat on it. What are you talking about? Uh, same thing, but maybe presented a little nicer, maybe slightly higher quality meat. But what I'm thinking of, you know, in a, in a restaurant, we'd have, uh, it could be uh, it could be shredded duck cone feet, it could be shredded pork, it could be more of a, a force meat mixed with a lot of fat. It's going to be pushed into a ramkin. And then you're going to pour a layer of fat on top until that congeals and hardens. And, you know, you'd keep it in the fridge. And when you want to eat it, you'd warm it up. You'd put it on some toast or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a confit meat. It's a braised meat. But, you know, sure, you could have it in cans, too. Yeah, 69 cents at Walmart. There's probably a little <laughs> yeah. more in England, I would imagine. Well, currently, 50, it's a 50-50 split as we sit here at 1016 Eastern tonight. Half the people voting have had it. And half the people voting have not had it. I've fallen the not had it uh, at this point. And uh, having my experience a couple weeks ago on a plane with a guy that cracked open a can next to me, I don't know I'm, if my urgency <laughs> is at top level to go ahead and try it after what it smelled like, but we'll leave it there for tonight. Before we talk about the searing seal in the juices, let's talk about your most recent video that you have up on YouTube channel. By the way, let me compliment you on... Uh, not only the great production value that you are bringing to the YouTube game, but also the deliberateness and the thoughtfulness and the scientific aspect to what you're doing, where you're not just saying, this is my opinion. I mean, you're testing stuff and you're giving, uh, you know, real world data to, to what you're kind of hypothesizing or whatever the topic mm-hmm. of the videos are. Are you inspired by anybody in particular through YouTube that you're trying to not emulate necessarily, but you like their style. So you're finding yourself being influenced. I mean, absolutely being influenced because uh, YouTube's a different medium for me. Um, While I owned a company that did a lot of YouTube videos with, with chef steps, uh, you know, I was pretty rarely on camera. I was busy sort of building out the business, building jewel, you know, figuring out how are we going to do this, but I wasn't in a lot of videos. So but I've done books before. I've actually been on TV shows in England with my former boss, Heston. So, uh, but you know, I'm the creator now. These are videos. I write the scripts. I come up with the ideas. Um, I do some, a little bit, teeny bit of the shooting, but I have a, a small group of people I work with for shooting and editing. And, and so, you know, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Of course, I'm looking at, at, at other great channels. And a lot of it is what can I do that's going to be interesting that, you know, there aren't already a bunch of guys doing a great job with. So, um, you know, I'm definitely trying to find my own style. But I'd say James Hoffman, um, who's a good friend of mine over in England, has a fantastic uh, YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of his stuff is great. Ethan Chobolowski, Adam Ragusia, you know, all great YouTubers. And there's a lot to learn from them. So let's talk about the tempering of steaks. And this is something maybe we don't talk about enough. It's 
it's all casually thrown about here. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we talk about when I do the barbecue round tables and we talk about steak specifically, I think one of the prep questions is, do you let your meat sit out and try and get to room temperature or do you just season it right out of the refrigerator and throw it on? And you took this to task a little bit. So what was your impetus for doing a video like this? And what'd you find out? So there was a series of videos I wanted to make sort of steak myths, right? So I, we can talk about the other one later, but I did, did searing seal in the juices. And, and so I had a list of ones I, I wanted to tackle. And, and should you temper your steak was one of the ones I wanted to, to do. And, you know, going into it, I think like a lot of people, I said, yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, that was my, my, my starting assumption of saying, no, no, it, does, it doesn't matter. And so I set up to do the tests and, and basically demonstrate it doesn't matter. And in my tests, it did matter. So I had to completely throw out the script and, and rewrite it. And I had to dive back into a little bit of some behind the scenes computer simulations, which is mostly me with uh, uh, lots of, of math. Um, I do have a background in, in thermodynamics and, and physics. So, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable working through the math. and I think I understood why it matters sometimes. And so I ended up doing a video saying, look, you, it's worth tempering your steak. It will cook more evenly. Is it the only way to do it? No, but you know, uh, what was interesting is, you know, I show on camera, Hey, you know, here's, here's an untempered steak. Here is a steak that I have tempered for four hours, sort of the maximum safe limit under the, uh, uh, FDA food code. Um, that the, the core has reached all the way to room temperature. And then here's five minutes and here's 15 minutes. And you can see by 15 minutes, there's an appreciable difference. The 15 minute steak is cooked more evenly. Uh, and what's funny is I, I show this, I explain the physics of why this is the case. What I don't think I anticipated was, uh, this was th- these were fighting words. Like half the comments were immediately, well, Kenji says, or oh. Google Foods says. <laughs> and I'm like, I know Kenji. I, you know, I, I, I called him up and we had a conversation. Like he didn't do the experiment the way I did. He got a different result. But it was very interesting that you're showing people the visual evidence. You're showing them on screen the unadulterated steak. And they refuse to believe it. They, they, you know, you, the, there's a, a, a serious segment of the internet that doesn't want to let go of their pre-existing beliefs, even when you show them the data that this indeed can matter. Well, I think so, that's uh, uh, I think that's the general public over the last twelve uh, years, if we're being honest, Chris. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I've sort of gotten comfortable with with uh, you know some people just don't want to change their their beliefs, and and that's fine. I, I present the data, I try to tell it in an interesting way, and I try to explain why. Uh, you know, the, there there really should be a part two of that video because you know. I know I'm disagreeing with Meathead, who has a has a, a, a post on his uh, site saying, "No, it doesn't matter." The answer is it only matters sometimes. Um, if you flip your steak very frequently, it doesn't matter. If you reverse sear, it definitely doesn't matter. If you sous vide cook, it doesn't matter. And and I I say the reverse sear and sous vide doesn't matter in your video. I, I didn't mention the if you flip your steak, it doesn't matter. I should have. And and the fundamental explanation is. You can bring heat to the surface of a steak, generally speaking, much faster than heat can move through to the core. And so if you bring too much heat to the surface really quickly, the heat all sort of bottlenecks up like a traffic jam right at the surface and the surface overcooks. So it turns out, you know, one of the things you can do to slow down how quickly you bring heat to the surface is reduce the temperature difference between the surface and the pan. And of course, you could lower the temperature of the pan, but if you temper your steak, just warming it a bit where the surface gets up to room temperature, that's going to slow the flow of heat in so that it can flow in and then flow towards the center uh, in a more balanced rate. And you get less of a traffic jam, you get less overcooking. And, you know, that's the physics behind it. It turns out you can get the same effect lots of different ways. Mm. But the adage that a lot of chefs have that tempering makes a difference turns out to be true in some cases. And in restaurants, you know, where I've worked, we would often, when the appetite, when the order came in and the appetizers are the first we're going to cook, the steak comes out of the out of the uh, the reach end. Maybe put some salt on it. We put it up uh, on a sizzle platter uh, on a high boy above the stove or something, and it's going to warm. The surface is going to warm up, you know, in the five or ten minutes uh, a bit. Now that's mostly a mise en place thing for chefs, but over time, a lot of us has figured out that yeah, that can cook more evenly. Um, or at least that's one way of doing it. So, you know, does it have anything it to do with the, with the thickness of it? Does it matter? It's just surface. 
uh, it, it's just the surface. Because yeah. if you think about it, like what part of your steak gets overcooked? The surface. And and so what you're trying to do is, sh is, is reduce the steepness of the temperature gradient to the surface. And so you can do that a bunch of ways. You can temper the steak. You can turn down the temperature of your pan or, or cool your grill off. You can flip every 30 seconds. You can reverse here. Anything that slows down how quickly you're bringing heat into the surface mm. so that it has time to leave the surface and go into the center is going to give you a more evenly cooked steak. And, and so a lot of the videos I want to do are trying to, you know, basically say there's some truth to these myths. Um, there's, you know, and and it's not always true. It depends on the case. But lots of people are very absolutist about these things of you should always temper the steak or you should never temper the steak. Like people want to be absolutes when it comes to cooking. And yet the reality of cooking is it's far more complicated than we think. And, and sometimes it matters. Once we get through the tempering of the steak argument, then yeah. we rebring up one of the fanciest arguments that have yeah. stayed around. Now, not only has it stayed around, if you watch enough cooking on television, yeah. even present day, you will hear undoubtedly somebody who is held in some type of culinary regard say, you want to put this sear on the steak, it's going to seal in the juices. We have long known on this show that searing doesn't seal in the juices. You can take a well-seared steak right off the grill and the outside is wet. So to me, yep. searing, sealing in the juice, that would be a very dry crust, and it's locked, mm -hmm. whatever's inside there, in there. It's not wet on the outside. If it sits on the plate for 30 seconds and you lift it up, there's not going to be any moisture on the plate, but always there is. So yep. what are you talking about when you're talking about sealing in the juices with searing? Yeah, so that's another one. I probably, I mean, uh, Harold McGee's talked about it. Uh, Meathead's talked about it. Kenji's talked about it. I wrote about it in Modernist Cuisine. Like everybody, you know, and yet it's a thing chefs say. It's a thing that, you know, uh, people on TV who are cooking say all the time, oh, you got to sear it to seal in the juices. And, you know, uh, again, I, I, when I first sat down to create the video, I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you all the reasons that's not true. I'm going to do this cool cutaway of the steak. I'm going to show you, look, there's steam coming out the crust. The sizzle in the pan is juices leaking out of the steak. We can weigh it before and after. We can, you know, we can do all these comparisons. We can use sous vide as a control. And, you know, it's pretty easy to debunk that, you know, that the crust holds in the juices even a little. Like, because somebody might make the argument, well, it's better than nothing. Well, actually, no, it, it's, it makes no difference. And, and I show that. But here's the thing, like who gives a crap about how much moisture is left in the, in the steak at the end of it? What, what you care about is how does it taste? You know, it, how, how juicy is it when you eat it? And you know, what occurred to me is that I had never really tried to test like, hey, does a seared, is a seared steak juicier than an unseared steak? And so for your viewers who haven't seen the video, the experiment was I'm gonna take a steak and I'm going to quickly sear it um, then I'm going to stop the, the cooking and I'm going to seal it sous vide. Uh, then I'm going to take another steak that's exactly the same steak. In fact, I split the steak in half and I did, I did this more times off camera than I show because that would make for boring videos. But, uh, and I did ones where I sous vide at first and I sear it later. I did all the permutations. The point is I cooked one steak that was identical with no searing, one that was seared. I took them out. I sliced them into the same size slices, the same weight. Uh, and then I, I chew them for exactly 20 seconds without any swallowing. Uh, and, and, and there's no delicate way to say this. I spit them out into a cup and I, I weigh the steak before and after chewing. Uh, because what, what, if you look at the, the world of sensory scientists, what sensory scientists have known for years is all of the juice that's actually in the steak after cooking, after the first two or three chews, your teeth are going to have squeezed it out and, and you, you swallow constantly while you're chewing, if you're a normal person. And so that juice is gone after the first two, three, four chews. And we've all had the experience of eating a steak that's kind of juicy at first, and then it gets very mealy and grainy and, and pappy, and, and that's a gross piece of meat, right? Um, for something to stay juicy, you have to provide the juice. You know, your saliva, you know, has to provide it. And so the thing I was sort of interested in is like, look, when we sear a steak, we get all these mired reactions, we get umami compounds, we get aroma compounds, we get taste it's these probably trigger a big saliva response. And sure enough, what I show is that the steak that had a crust on it with no salt, no pepper, no seasonings put on this, just, just seared, that steak ends up 30% juicier than the perfectly cooked sous vide steak with, with no crust on it because you're adding about 30% of the weight 
of the meat in juices. You keep it juicy. And so this is a great example where I think what happens often in culinary myths is somebody cooks something and observes something is better. It's juicier. It's more delicious. And that is often true. But then, you know, people like to create a mechanism. They like to explain it. It's like in barbecue. They say, you know, the stall is caused by collagen melting or fat rendering. We all like to ascribe mechanisms, but never do the experiments. So you had, I think, this adage that has stayed with us for hundreds of years. If you have to sear the piece of meat to seal in the juices, when what you're really describing is, yeah, a seared piece of meat tastes juicier than a, than a poorly seared piece of meat. I think so, also you know, there's some truth to that. When you hear the chef or the expert mm-hmm. say searing seals in the juices, the at homer mm-hmm. says, well, I want a juicy steak and that's the way mm-hmm. I have to execute in order to make sure that the steak is juicy. I have to sear yep. it. And they're not thinking at all about how their mouth is going to salivate or yeah. what triggers it's going to have. They just want to make sure they're doing it like the expert says. Yeah. And, and uh, so, yes, people just sort of follow the rules and, and they look for experts or authorities and you, you choose your favorite expert, you choose your favorite YouTuber or TV chef. And then, you know, you tend to slavishly repeat everything they say or do, even though like we're all wrong a lot. Um, and so I think it's kind of interesting to come along and say, hey, let's let's challenge that. Let's put it to the test and see if it's actually true. And in a lot of cases, it's not. And I think one of the reasons this was so interesting is you have a lot of people that start to obsess over, you know, I don't want to overcook the steak while searing it. I don't want to cook out all the juices. I don't want to, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I need to rest it so that it stays juicy and all of these things. And it turns out actually don't worry about that. Like searing it will actually make it seem juicier because it's more delicious. <laughs> hmm. uh, what other experiments are you working on? <laughs> so uh, you, you know I did a series of videos reviewing sort of smart ovens from Ninja and the new Breville Jewel oven and the uh, uh, the June oven that, that's now owned by Weber. Um, <laughs> Well, I, uh, I finished that up. I ended up with a lot of countertop ovens I didn't need. So I took the, uh, I, I disassembled, the, and, and I, in my review, I say the, the Ninja oven has the best convection fan of any oven. It's actually pretty great. It's a, it's, I, you know, I have no relationship to Ninja, but I think it's a great product. Uh, and I had two of them for testing. So I took one of them apart, uh, acquired a very large glass fish tank, and I have built a glass smoker. Uh, Because I want to do some time lapses of barbecue that you're seeing into the smoker while it cooks. We can do cutaways because there's a bunch of stuff around like, you know, we talk about things like, hey, um, you know, can can smoke stick, you know, if you pre-cook a piece of meat and then you smoke it, will it be worse than if I smoke from raw? Things like that. There's Mm -hmm. there's a ton of myth and lore in barbecue that I think is interesting to test. I, I love barbecue. And so I built the sort of ultimate controllable glass smoker where I have temperature control and humidity control and smoke control so that I can run these uh, tests. So, so later this summer, there should, there should be some fun stuff. Any updates on the combustion ink side of things? Uh, I think the main updates are uh, we just had a major update to our mobile app so that it has graphing. You can see the data from all eight sensors. We made some nice improvements to the predictions, particularly for low and slow cooking, which is pretty relevant as we get into barbecue season. Um, We'll have some stuff to announce uh, towards the end of this month about longer ranges and some new accessories, but mostly we're just listening to customers, taking the feedback and, you know, continuing to take what, has so far been a very good product and polish it and make it better and build out the features people are asking for. Chris Young is the owner of Combustion Inc. Uh, that's combustion.inc from a website perspective. And make sure you're going over to youtube.com and then it's uh, at Chris Young Cooks and you could subscribe to him and see all the great videos that he's doing. Chris, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for doing it. Greg, thank you very much for having me. Have a great night. That's Chris Young right there. I'm telling you, it's worth a subscribe and to see. He's got a pan that he's cut in half so you can actually see the steak that's cooking. And that steak has been cut in half. You can see everything happening in the cross section. I mean, how many people are cutting pans in half and showing you all that stuff? Great content. I love it. Well worth a subscribe. And again, 70, almost 73,000, 72,000 people subscribing. He references Guga. I meant to ask him if Guga is like the biggest joke or not currently. I'm not going to answer that, but I would ask Chris. I'm sure he would answer, actually. So we'll save that for next time. Smoking Joe is ready to go. 
Before we get to him, I'll talk to you about Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. A curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies known for the championship rubs and seasonings. Popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit and in the backyard. Big Papa offering 13 perfectly balanced flavors, transforming ordinary meals into extraordinary meals. Plus, they own Granny's Barbecue Sauce. So if you're looking for a new go-to sauce that will please everybody, Granny's traditional yet powerful flavor reminds us of why we fell in love with barbecue in the first place. Find Granny's Barbecue Sauce and other top-rated barbecue sauces at BigPapaSmokers.com. And aside from the premium sauces and rubs, they're selling cookers. So if you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, you might want to check out that Mac two-star general pellet cooker. Big Papa's the exclusive Mac dealer, even offering special packages. If you're not a fan of pellet smokers or you don't know what grill you might need, call them. 877-828-0727. That's 877-828-0727. Or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers. Com. We are back with Joe Martinez right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Let's get back to a guy who has more experience giving you his opinion than he actually has cooking. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. And we thank Chris Young for joining us the last segment. This portion of the show being brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via Bluetooth. If you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home, you're in luck because Fireboard is fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. That's the good folks over at Fireboard. Uh, Jason King just sent me a image through Photoshop, and I look like I'm half drunk. So, Jason, get ready for a screen capture and uh, take this ready in three, two, one. All right. There we go. Hope everybody grabbed that. If not, go back into the video archives and then do whatever you do with that. But send it to me, and I'll put it on the new website that we got. By the way, we got a new website. Remember that? Yeah. Coming out of the bullpen tonight is the owner-operator of Smoke and Joe's Pit Barbecue Food Trailer. He's the focus of the 2023 Podgimentary Series. And he is here for the second of four quarterly appearances this year, sharing the good, the bad, the ugly of operating a barbecue food trailer. And outside of the business, he's also a prolific YouTube creator, who generates some of the most impressive content out there on that platform. Let's welcome back our pal, Joe Martinez. All right, Joe, before we get into visit two, there is a YouTube poll question of the week. Because I asked everybody, have you ever eaten potted meat? Yes or no? What say you? Well, if a can is labeled potted meat, the answer is no. But (laughs) no, 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 (laughs) no. (laughs) <laughs> Corn beef hash and spam absolutely. All right. So no to the can labeled potted meat. By the way, the no's have just bridged and taken the lead back over at 52%. We were nodded at 50% all the way through Chris Young's segment there. So we are neck and neck. We'll see how it ends up here as the show concludes. Uh Joe, you were first on uh, about 3 months ago. We went well into the background why you started the trailer and everything involved getting it to day 1 of opening sales. So correct me if I'm wrong, but as we looked at the money investment, was it like 75 grand or so in before you opened for day 1? Yeah, 75,000. That's um that doesn't include the smoker. That's just the trailer itself. Um so yeah, it's it's right at 75,000. All right. So Just making sure we keep this in perspective in true operating uh, where we're at today. You've been up and running now for about seven months? Correct, seven months. All right, so this interview is going to carry from day one of being open through those first three months. So you ready to go? Let's go. Here we go. So after all the prep work is done, you spend all this money, you get the cooker, you found the space that you're going to be putting up with, you've done the hype, blah, blah, blah. 
What was day one of real barbecue sales like for Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue? Sales were good, but it was a nightmare, Greg. Um, <laughs> everything, I mean, you know, you, you plan so much for it and, you, you know, you hope everything goes well, but uh, things did not start off well that morning. Um, we had some gas problems inside the trailer. I couldn't light my oven, my fryer, my my flat top. And, and you know how sometimes gas grills will get like an air pocket and you have to unplug and disconnect and bleed and all this other stuff. So that's what was happening. Well, it ended up being the regulator was too small for the trailer. Mm. And uh, that caused us to open up about 45 minutes later than we anticipated. Um, but there was a lot of other things that happened, obviously, that made it a little bit more difficult aside from the gas problem we had. When the first day ends, what was the one thing you needed to immediately change before you went back at it the next day? Uh, probably not change, but, but learn our, our point of sale system. Um, because part of that, part of the problem that we had at opening day was <clears throat> customers, you know, they had a pad on the outside of the trailer and where they would sign for their order and leave a tip if they want to leave a tip, but they also had the option to not print a receipt or print a receipt. Well, many customers were choosing to not print a receipt. Well, what was happening was that order was getting lost. I had customers lining up outside and I'm, you know, I'm asking them, you know, what were you waiting for? He said, well, I'm waiting for my order. I said, do, do you have your receipt? And, well, I don't have my receipt. And I'm like, do you remember what you ordered? <laughs> and they said, yeah, I remember exactly what I ordered. So, you know, I took it for granted and obviously I didn't know my point of sale system like I do now. So that created a little bit of a heartache and mm -hmm. kind of put us behind a little bit, but, um, definitely the point of sale i had to learn that thing immediately like there was no no way around it there was no shortcuts to it yo yo oh dear Hmm. Joe has fallen off the face of the earth, but it does appear that we're still up and running. Yeah, yeah, YouTube is weighing in there. The Ides of May are upon the show. Oh, dear. <laughs> Not only did he have a poor regulator for the propane, he has bottlenecked the internet. Oh, dear going on in texas remember this is the state that wants to secede from the union the union <laughs> we're self-sufficient just never have it get cold and don't ask me to do any internet because it's not gonna work oh wait there he is joe sorry we're not making fun of you don't worry Oh, my right. God. We're talking about problems with my food truck, and we had internet problems. Here. Oh, yeah. Don't worry. We, we capped everything there in a very hilarious way. So you're talking about getting to know the point of sale and how it was very important for you. Did you have anything to tie up on that? Yeah. So, you know, I don't know how much of that you caught, but uh, customers were, were opting to not get a receipt, and I was losing orders, and it just caused us to kind of get behind a little bit. But we worked it out. But, you know, if there was one thing – you know, that I had to learn. The biggest thing was learn learn your point of sale system, the ins and outs, how to reprint receipts and stuff like that. Who do you use? Uh, Toast. Oh, really? Toast, yeah. Came highly recommended from uh, your your pal, Sean oh, White. When it doesn't Walters. work, it's my pal. <laughs> yeah, I see. your pal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is that a thing where you, because you've heard really good rave reviews about it, it was just something that you thought was going to be easy or... Like what, where was the misstep? Yeah. You know, I thought it was, I thought I had it figured out. Um, yeah. but you know, there's so many things, uh, getting ready for opening day that, that you forget some of the little stuff, you know, and, and it, it was overlooked if you will. And, and, uh, that's not, that's not the most exciting thing that happened that day, but that was something that kind of made us fall behind a little bit. What's the most exciting thing that happened? <clears throat> well, so we ended up opening 45 minutes late. Uh, 1145 
And we were sold out in four hours, okay? <clears throat> but in the thick of it, in the thick of it, I had a deep fryer in there. And I didn't want a deep fryer because <clears throat> I don't think deep fryers belong in food trucks, barbecue food trucks. And um, so my nephew got the, the bottle of butter that we're using on the griddle and laid it on the top of the fryer, which was really hot. So when we're taking care of customers, we hear this big pop. Well, the bottle had melted into the deep fryer oh. and that chemical reaction of the plastic hitting the deep fryer, it got smoky inside the food trailer. We had fries that were frying. And I had to turn off the fryer and I, I had to take the fries off the, off the menu, you know, wow. for our smoke burgers. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, oil was splattering everywhere because <laughs> I don't mix, I guess. But yeah, it was a mess. One of my questions here to follow up on that first day was as you were opening and as it related to labor, because it sounds like you have somebody there with it, was it just you or did you, did you have volunteers or did you hire uh, some labor help? So it was me and my brother, which right now it's still currently my brother and I, and my wife was there, my daughter was there, and then my nephew um, volunteered to help out, and he helped out by melting that butter, uh, that bottle of butter into the deep fryer. Your but late no, nephew, yeah. you mean? <laughs> yeah, my late <laughs> nephew. <laughs> wow. Uh, biggest takeaways during the first two to three weeks of being open? Oh, man, biggest takeaways is, man, you, you know – the one thing for me, Greg, was I thought I knew the business. You know, I thought I knew barbecue, but I know barbecue. But when it comes to running the business, like actually selling, it's a different ball game, man. And and you know, I had some restaurant experience. You know, I used to work at a Dairy Queen. I worked at McDonald's when I was going to school in Phoenix and stuff like that. But it's nothing like running your own business. Um, so you know, the one thing that I would highly recommend is. Ask for help if if you can go somewhere and and help a, a, a barbecue restaurant. If you're going to start a food truck, go to a barbecue joint in your area and, and ask the owner, hey, can I work here for a couple of weeks, man, just to get my feet wet? Let me charge customers. Let me clean your restrooms. Let me clean your pit. Let me see what this is about. Um, and I did that, but I should have done more of it because I think mm -hmm. I would have learned a lot more doing that. What did business look like at the end of month one? What kind of money are you generating revenue-wise? So our first month in business, uh, granted, we're just opened up uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, we did seventeen thousand dollars in sales, um, which again we're not uh, making that much money at that point. You know, my food cost was uh, in the forty percent uh, range, which is extremely high. Um, you know, I, I'm I, now I've you know obviously I found vendors where I can get things at a little bit better price, but. When you first get started, there's so much money that gets dumped into, you know, things that you're going to need. Um, but, um, yeah, it was it was it was a rough uh, first month. But you know, I learned a lot the first month as well. Do you make any changes to the trailer or the business or the menu or whatever as you lead into that second month? Huh? Oh, absolutely. We've um, we added. I've changed my menu twice since I've opened. Um, but I did change the menu once I got rid of my deep fryer. Um, <laughs> cause one of the things, you know, I, I really didn't want a deep fryer to begin with. And after that first day, I was like, okay, I'm getting rid of it. So I put did a, somebody a talk machine. you into getting it. I mean, I, I feel like you were the biggest advocate of not wanting it. And then somehow somebody strong armed you into it, even though you didn't want it. Yeah, the builder of the food truck said, hey, man, I have this deep fryer right here. Check it out. I said, yeah, I'll throw it in there. And um, But I, end, I ended up getting rid of it because we had our, our sodas in ice coolers outside of the trailer, and customers would have to grab their own sodas. And I didn't want to have to continue to buy ice every single morning. So I, I got a cooler. I contacted my Coke rep, and uh, it's the best decision I've ever made. You know, get rid of the fryer and put a soda machine in there. Uh, what was business like then in month two as it closes out? So month two actually slowed down. <clears throat> so we're heading into November now, heading into winter. Um, and I started September 24th was our first day of opening. Um, October, we had a really good month. Well, decent month. And then November, December came. And, and when you're in a food truck, the one thing that that you have to factor in is that your customers are going to have to sit outside and eat their food. And if the weather is terrible, 
um, they're not going to come out. If it's cold, you know, if it's 30 degrees, they're not going to come out there and sit and, and eat barbecue, you know. They won't um, even get it to go? No. Well, back then I I wasn't set up to – no, I, I did have some to-go customers, but I wasn't set up with some of your delivery services like, you know, um, DoorDash and, and Uber Eats and stuff, which I should have done from the get-go. As you get going on month three, are you still – running the same plan as month two or are you also making adjustments from month two to month three yeah make the 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 biggest adjustments and this is probably one of the biggest battles greg is is and i should know this with my previous job you know um where you have historical sales so we didn't have any historical sales it's my first year open and i don't know what the next day is going to bring what you know, are customers going to show up? Are they not going to show up? So I started adjusting pretty aggressively, you know, um, by, you know, limiting the number of briskets that I cooked that day, the number of racks of ribs that I cooked that day. So I started adjusting. So if I was slow, if my food cost was lower, I was still better off, you know, than having a extremely high food cost. And at the end of the day, having to throw so much food away. So I had to learn to adjust that and, and, all of our sides included, not just the proteins, but our sides as well. As you close out that first three months or the first quarter of operating, where are you at gross revenue was? Um, we generated right at forty-eight thousand dollars in the first uh, three months of, of business, and you know that was enough, Greg. Uh, that was enough to you know to pay myself and my brother and my daughter started working with us as a cashier as well. So. Um, again, I'm not getting rich the first three months. I know that it was going to be difficult, especially, you know, being that I started, uh, in winter Had I started in the summer, things may have been different, but I'm, I'm almost glad that I started in the winter. Um, cause I, again, I get to put my feet in the, in the water, if you will, a little bit at a time and, you know, kind of grow with the business instead of just getting thrown into the fire. Are you ahead or behind what your expectation or what your benchmarks might have been for that first quarter? I'm I'm a little behind. Um, you know, I was expecting more, but I will say this. So the first day that 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 we opened, uh, we did thirty eight hundred dollars in sales. That just that one day, and I reached out to uh, a local uh, barbecue owner. He was in the Texas top fifty or Texas monthly top fifty barbecue restaurants. And he started in a food truck and I talked to him after my first day and I was tired. I mean, I was dead tired. And he says, how did it go, Joe? And I said, man, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we only did like $3,800. He's like, what? And he, I said, yeah, we did $3,800, man. The first day we sold out in four hours. He goes, Joe, he goes, that's a great day for a barbecue truck. I mean, are you kidding me for a food truck? That is a great day. And I was like, okay, well, that made me feel a little bit better, you know? So he kind of reassured me that, hey, man, it's okay. You're, you're doing great, you know. Aside from being able to pay your brother, uh, you know, your daughter, the cashier, yourself a little bit, um, are you also reinvesting any net profits back into that business? Yes. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm doing. You know, I started um, looking at ways to grow our business, you know, what? because I don't want to be in a food truck forever. I don't want to do another winter in the food truck. Um, you know, if I find a place where my customers can sit down and enjoy their, their lunch or dinner and it's covered and it's got heated or air conditioned, that's fine. But, um, I'm starting to, to save a lot of money because I want to get a, uh, you know, ghost kitchen, still operate my food truck, but I want to get a ghost kitchen and, and expand my business that way. And there's a lot of things that, that you need even, after the first month of opening, you start to figure out that, man, I don't have this and I don't need this. So whether it's a refrigerator, uh, maybe a deep freeze that you're going to need. So there's things that you're going to need that are kind of come along. So, you know, you have to budget for that. Anytime that you're starting a food truck, there's, you think you have it all, but there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come up that you better have the money for it. If not, it's going to hurt you. What are you hearing from the customers, folks that are coming to pay their money, eat your food, what are they enjoying the most? What kind of feedback do you get? You know, I get a lot of really good feedback, Greg. Um, that's the one thing that I think keeps me going. And I think that any good cook or a chef or a pit master appreciates that when a customer, 
when you go out there and say, hey, how's the food? And they say, man, this this brisket is amazing. You know, they I've heard things like, you know, and I, and I appreciate all the feedback and the customers are like, man, I've been all over Texas. I've been to Austin and your brisket is up there with the best of them, man. You're you're doing you're doing the right thing. Your food is absolutely amazing. You know, it's you just got to get continue on the path that you're on and, and let more people know that you're actually here because we didn't know you were here. But, you know, obviously I do have a, a pretty decent YouTube channel and you'd be surprised, Greg, how many subscribers will travel to come eat at my barbecue food truck. Really? Um, yeah. And that was <clears throat> that's probably the, the biggest uh, appreciation of it. You know, when I have somebody that comes in from California, hey, I drove in from California you know, just to come eat your barbecue. And I was like, wow, man, that's, that's, you know, that makes me feel good, you know? So a lot of really good compliments, uh, but the brisket, obviously the sausage, the sides, you know, everybody likes all the food pretty much in the food truck. What are you doing over from a promotions standpoint at the end of the first quarter to continue to keep the hype and generate that interest? Nothing promotional outside of my social media accounts. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got some, a decent size, you know, social media, you know, on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. And, and again, if I go live on TikTok, for example, if I'm trimming briskets one morning, um, I'll have a customer that shows up and said, Hey, I saw you on TikTok. And, and I said, Oh man, you're in El Paso. I noticed that you're at this place or whatever. I had no idea that you were here. So that's one piece of advice, Greg, if I could say this, you know, a lot of people that want to start a food truck and, or any type of business, if you don't have a social media account, you better start one up, man, because it really helps. It's absolutely free to do it. And if I didn't have the following that I do on YouTube or Instagram, I don't think I'd have half of the business that I have right now. So, you know, if you're if you're going to start a food truck, man, you, you've got to start a food truck or a, a social media accounts to get your name out there. I know my friend, Sean Walchef, is a big proselytizer of digital storytelling, and he's always telling people, you know, get over yourself, start telling your story. Nobody tells your story better than you do. And obviously that's something that you're latching on and running with and reaping the rewards of. So congratulations to you on that. Outside of the business, Joe, what's home life like? How are you feeling physically, mentally, and all that stuff outside of the business? Honestly, physically, I am tired. I am tired. I've never work so hard in my life. You know, I'm talking 16, 17 hour days. Um, but what's crazy, Greg, is that our body is a, it's an amazing thing because I never thought I could work 17 hours, you know, 17 hour shift. And it's like, my body is used to it. Like mm -hmm. to me right now, I'm tired, but I love doing what I'm doing. So that's what keeps me going. And I'm not like completely out of gas at the end of the day, but I am dead tired. I've never worked so hard in my life, but you know, like Sean said, you know, um, or, uh, the, you were saying earlier that nobody tells a story like you will, well, nobody cares about the business more than you ever will. And if you're not there, you know, I don't think that your business will survive. So I've got to be there, um, a hundred percent of the time right now, at least while I'm growing the, the business. So I'm asking you to look back at the end of month three, after that first quarter of business had ended, how were you planning for those next three months? What did you want to see happen? Well, obviously, like like everything, I mean, we want to see our business grow. And, you know, so I started looking at, you know, things that I could do. And, and I looked at, uh, you know, I reached out to some uh, local advertising companies like the news and stuff that can help you advertise. But, you know, I wanted to grow my business more and more. So there's things that I did. You know, I got into um, DoorDash, you know, DoorDash. Actually, I started that in December and that has helped tremendously. So if you don't have any walk up customers, you know, if you can generate three, four, five, six hundred dollars a day in just DoorDash orders or electronic orders, I guess, if you want to call them from any company, um, you have got to jump on that game because while you're sitting there expect, you know, waiting for a customer to walk up, um, the internet and the world is changing. You know, people are ordering groceries online. I mean, and, and food online like crazy. And if you're not in that, you're missing out on so much right now. 
We are talking with the owner-operator of Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue, the barbecue food trailer out there in El Paso, Joe Martinez. You can find him on YouTube, of course, and on Instagram, as you can see there on the lower third, at Smoking Joe's Pit BBQ. Joe, anything else uh, during those first three months that we haven't talked about or that you would like to add here before I cut you loose tonight? No, man. And anybody starting a new business, you know, don't give up. It's a, it's a lot of work. But uh, if, you, if you can see the the light at the end of the tunnel, man, it's there is light at the end of the tunnel and it's getting better. And I can't wait to tell you guys uh, about the first or second quarter and third quarter of being in business. All right, Joe, always appreciate the time. Continued success. And we'll talk to you again in three months. Thanks, Craig. Smoking Joe right there. So what I appreciate from Joe and also what I appreciated from Rusty last year is these guys are totally transparent, telling us exactly what they're experiencing because I do believe that there is a number of folks out there who were in Joe's position, tired of the 9 to 5, tired of the corporate gig to have a barbecue background of some degree, whether it's just a backyard, maybe they've done it in competitions. You've seen a lot of guys transfer out of the competition ranks to get into the restaurant ranks or the food trailer ranks for that reason. And uh, Joe was doing it, and now he's giving us all the perspective and all the experience, the good, bad, and the ugly, as I said there in the beginning, of what it's like for him out there in El Paso. So we will catch up with him and see what the second quarter of business looks like and by the third visit, we'll be more caught up to present day here. Uh, definitely by the end of the year for that fourth visit, we'll uh, bring it up to where he is currently. And that way everybody will know where we stand here at the end of 2023. But great info. And again, appreciate John's openness and candor as he answers all the questions for all of us to learn and be able to be a little bit more wiser on if we should take that step as well. Uh, I can know one thing. I'm not doing that. But plenty of great feedback here in the instant chat and through some emails that I'm getting as well, talking about Joe being a great guest and being really open and appreciating that interview. So thanks to Joe for continuing to do this. I know it can't be easy, especially talking about the not great times, but those are the things that people want to hear about. I mean, it'd be great. Everybody I'm making a shitload of money. Everything's easy. My barbecue is the greatest. I'm going to be number one on Texas top 50 next year, all that stuff. That's not real life. Real life is having your nephew put the bottle of butter grease on top of the oil and it pops and it goes into the deep fryer and you're screwed. That's what we want to hear about. The real stuff. So we appreciate Joe for that. All right, let's wrap it up here. Stick around. We'll be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. And we thank Joe Martinez for joining us last time. I've been talking about that food trailer business that he has going on, the 2023 podgementary subject, as we call it here on the show. Dan on the instant chat saying food truck round table in a future episode, please. Maybe. Maybe indeed. All right, let's go ahead and break loose as we are just a bit over the top of the hour, all the way back in the first hour. It was Meathead from AmazingRibs.com in his usual Tuesday segment, and then followed him with Robert Moss, RobertFMoss.com, talking about the Hall of Fame and also Brunswick Stew. He did mention the word burgoo, which I think is the Kentucky stew. That closed the first hour. They moved to the second hour. First guest at 14 past the second hour was Chris Young from Combustion.Inc. And then closing out the show, Joe Martinez from Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue. The third Tuesday of the month is next week, and I believe will be revisited by the first time in many, many months. A barbecue icon, Stephen Reichland, will be showing up next month, amongst many others. Maybe Susie Bullock will make an appearance. So stay tuned for that. If you missed the show yesterday on the 10 finalists for the Barbecue Hall of Fame, it is in the podcast feed. Make sure you go back and get that. 
And if you're just tuning in live right now, don't worry. Hour number one tomorrow in podcast, hour number two on Thursday, and then the best moments of on Friday. So how do I always leave? September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now. Hi, this is Bobby Rempe from Cleveland, Ohio, and you're listening to Barbecue Central.